come in and be seated. So this is our second research briefing session. We have people, these are the new members uh, who in this case were elected in 20, 2021 and 22. We have six classes. Uh, the membership is divided into six classes. Uh, each class selects one person who they think will convey to a broad scientific audience uh, Th what they've done, what they've accomplished, and hopefully they'll tell you a little bit about themselves, how they got into science or into the field that they're working in. So, um, I'm going to start. Our first speaker of the second section is Julie Therio. She is professor at the University of Washington. She's a Howard Hughes uh, investigator. She's chief scientific advisor of the Allen Institute for Cell Biology. She represents class two section on Cellular and Developmental Biology, and the title of her talk is Force, Direction, and Persistence, How Cells Crawl. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to be speaking here today, and I'm particularly happy to have the opportunity to tell you all about how cells crawl. So these are some photographs of crawling cells, and the structures in green are made of a protein called actin, which I'll tell you much more about. The best way to appreciate the beauty and the mystery of cell crawling is just to watch it in action. So first I'm going to share with you an experiment that was done about 10 years ago by Tim Lammerman. And what he did was to engineer a mouse so that it expressed a green fluorescent protein from jellyfish in every one of its neutrophils. This is a type of white blood cell. And in this movie, you see the neutrophils here in green. And then over on the right, you see the um, collagen extracellular matrix that makes your ear nice and stiff. And when this time-lapse movie starts to play, You'll see in the side of the circle, that was where he induced a laser wound on the microscope. And you see as the cells are crawling around, they home towards that wound. And they're going there to clean up debris and also to fight off or neutralize any potential source of infection. So every time you get a tiny injury or a tiny infection, your white blood cells do this. They crawl through your tissues to find the site of the problem and then try to clean it up on your behalf. Now, there's a lot going on in this movie. The neutrophils have to detect where the wound is. They also communicate with one another. What I'm going to talk about today is just the fundamental problem of how they actually move, how they physically crawl through the tissue. This is a special case of a much more general problem in biology, which is understanding how biological organization can be built without the existence of any blueprints. Now, in some simple sense, there is, of course, a blueprint in biology, which is the genetic code and that nucleotide sequences in DNA determine the order of amino acids in a polypeptide. But this kind of blueprint really does not get us very far in terms of understanding biological organization. The amino acids in that polypeptide have to fold up into a three-dimensional shape to make a functional protein, and then about a billion of those proteins have to come together and cooperate to make a typical animal cell. And then a trillion animal cells have to work together to build a single multicellular organism such as ourselves. Animals, of course, can also cooperate to build structures that are much larger than themselves. So this termite mound is about two meters tall, and it's got an elaborate air conditioning system that's built to keep the nest cool in the desert. But it's built by little insects that are only two millimeters long. And I would stipulate that there is probably not a termite architect that tells them how to build this structure. Instead, the structure has to emerge from local interactions among the insects. So how does this work at the cellular level? Well, using a variety of techniques, we can find the locations of proteins and protein complexes inside of cells, really to an arbitrary degree of precision. But that doesn't really tell us how they got there and how they're able to cooperate with one another, one another to build these beautiful, elaborate, gorgeous, large-scale structures like this Purkinje cell drawn by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. So the central question to me in cell biology is, with only local molecular interactions, no blueprint, no architect, and no clear global privileged state, how is it that the generation of biological form and dynamic functions such as cell crawling can be so robust? In the context of cell crawling, a central role is played by the proteins of the cytoskeleton. And as the name implies, these are the proteins that make up the bones of the cell. In particular, I'm going to focus today on this protein called actin. Actin is a small globular protein, and relatives of actin are found in basically all the branches of life on Earth. 
it is able to fold up and bind and hydrolyze a molecule of ATP, which is a source of chemical energy in the cell. But what's really special about it is actin is able to bind to other copies of actin in order to make these beautiful helical filament structures. Now, when just two actin monomers come together or three actin monomers come together, those are very unstable and they're likely to fall apart. But as soon as you get four or more, they can add a bunch of other actin monomers to grow into a filament that could be hundreds or thousands of subunits long. It's very reasonable to think of these as being like Legos. They snap together in a particular orientation because of their shape, but then they can be also disassembled and then rearranged to form a new kind of structure. In eukaryotic cells, cells with a true nucleus, like ourselves or like plants, there are also hundreds of other actin-associated proteins that are able to bind to these filaments and modulate their assembly and disassembly. For example, capping proteins that can bind to the end of a filament and stop it from growing anymore, severing proteins that chop it up into smaller pieces, or bundling proteins that can bring them together to make cross-linked parallel bundles or cross-linked webs. One particularly important aspect of this is that new daughter filaments can be born by branching off the side of a pre-existing mother filament. This is catalyzed by a protein complex called the ARP23 complex, and that is a mechanism to overcome this kinetic barrier to nucleation that makes it difficult to form a new filament. Because of the versatility of this complete array of actin-associated proteins, it's possible for different eukaryotic cells to make a huge array of actin structures, as illustrated in this beautiful poster that was assembled by Katrina Vell. Now, at the same scale, here's our neutrophil. And zooming in a little more, I want to particularly draw your attention to this actin-rich structure right at the front of the cell that's called the lamellipodium. This is made up of a very dense cross-linked web of actin filaments. And if we look in the electron microscope, we can see that this web is made up with lots of these mother-daughter branches of the kind that I just described. Now, this looks like a very stiff, rigid, strong structure, which it is. But at the same time, it's got to be able to move and dynamically rearrange itself very quickly as the cell is crawling. So this is a movie showing a human neutrophil isolated from peripheral blood and then put on a glass cover slip where it's just crawling around at random. And you can see this movement is actually shown in real time. So this is actually what you would see if you look down a microscope at one of your own white blood cells crawling around. Now we can use genetic tricks to take the same green fluorescent protein from jellyfish and fuse it to the actin protein so we can see where actin is in one of these crawling cells. And you can see it's um, highly enriched, sorry, highly enriched in this um, lamellipodium at the front, but it's also moving around, uh, rearranging itself very, very rapidly as the cell is changing direction. And so, you know, this is really a, a really puzzling question as to how it is that assembly and disassembly of these actin filaments can happen for thousands and thousands of filaments in the lamellipodium, but in a purposeful way that enables the cell to move in one direction. Now, that's a really hard question. So to make some progress on that question, we turn to a simpler system. And this is a bacterial pathogen called Listeria monocytogenes, which causes a rare but very serious form of food poisoning. And Listeria has figured out how to actually get inside of the cells of the human or other mammal that it infects and use the actin from those host cells to build these structures called comet tails that push the bacteria around inside of the cells. Now, one of the reasons that this turned out to be a simpler problem to solve is because we don't actually need an intact host cell in order for the bacterium to grow a comet tail. We can crack open the cells to make something called a cytoplasmic extract and put in the bacteria and some fluorescent actin, and then we can watch them move around just as if they were happily inside of an infected host cell. We can track the position very accurately to measure the speed, and then we can also measure things like actin dynamics in the comet tails. So the first question is just, you know, where is the actin assembly? How do these things grow? And when you look at a bacterium and its associated comet tail uh, over time, it sort of looks as if the whole structure is moving together. If that were true, then we should be able to put a little mark on some of the filaments that are right up at the front of the tail and see them moving along with the bacterium. But in fact, when we did that experiment, what we found is that the filaments remain stationary. What this must mean is that the filaments are assembling at the front of the comet tail, right next to the bacterial surface, and that seems to be what's pushing the bacteria through the host cell. It turns out the reason this works is because there is a bacterial protein on the surface called Acte that binds to and activates this ARP23 complex, which I described as able to initiate the growth of a daughter filament off the side of a pre-existing mother. And it's the growth of that daughter filament that actually generates force to push the bacterium through the host cell. 
Now, if this were true, we should be able to get rid of the bacterium and replace it with an artificial particle that's just coated with this one protein, ACT-A. This experiment was done by my very first graduate student, Lisa Cameron, who put that protein on these plastic beads and it showed that when you drop them into a cytoplasmic extract, they grow comet tails and crawl around just like a real bacterium. So how is it that filament growth can actually generate force? This is a very non-intuitive way to generate force in a biological system. Well, the basic idea is you have all these filaments, daughter filaments, that are growing up against the surface of the bacterium, but they're undergoing thermal fluctuations. And when they bend far enough away, a little actin monomer can sneak in on the end, and that will generate a force to push on the load. The theory for this had actually been worked out very well. We know how much chemical energy is released by protein binding. We know how much mechanical energy it takes to generate force to move an object. And putting those together with critical numbers, like the concentration of actin inside of a cell, we can calculate the maximum amount of force that could be generated by this process. Now, it's a very non-intuitive mechanism, but for the biologists, I just want to let you know the force is 5 to 10 piconewtons, which is just about the same as the force that you get from a single molecular motor, such as myosin or kinesin. Armed with this knowledge, we could actually design experiments to directly measure the force. So, for example, here we're attaching this bacterial ACT-A protein onto a tiny cantilever like a diving board, and we can watch as the actin network grows and deflects that cantilever and use that to measure the force generated. Using a slightly different method, we can measure forces of just individual filaments or a few filaments working together. And as a whole, these measurements really agree very well with those theoretical predictions. So at the front of the comet tail, this is what's going on. There are branches being formed, and those daughter filaments are pushing against the bacterium. But what about the rest of the structure? What determines its size and its shape? Well, another critical concept here is that the filaments right up at the top there, right next to the bacterium, are young. They've just been born. They're just starting to grow. And as we move backwards through the comet tail, we see older and older filaments. Some of these other actin-associated proteins have a different time, different kinetics associated with their activity. So the capping proteins, for example, come on a little bit slower and stop filament growth. And then these uh, severing proteins disassemble the oldest filaments. So this process is able to work in perpetuity because the youngest filaments are born at the bacterial surface. They grow and push. The middle-aged filaments just stop growing. And then the oldest filaments are taken apart, and they're recycled for their parts. We're pretty confident that this is a complete description of what we need to understand this process because John Alberts and Gary O'Dell were able to take just these few physical principles and measured quantities for things like the concentrations and kinetic rate constants for these proteins and be able to simulate something that looks very convincingly like this bacterial comet tail. Okay, great. Can we apply this concept, these methods, to understanding cell crawling? Well, for this, we turn to a cell type that comes from the skin of fish. Fish are covered with scales. Those scales are actually covered with a teeny bit of skin. And so when you pluck a scale off a fish and you put it on a glass cover slip, um, over a period of a few hours, you can see tissue start to crawl off from the edges of the scale. And here you can see initially this group of a few hundred cells all crawls off together, but over time, individual cells will break off from the end of the tissue and go off buzzing around on their own. Now let me show you what their actin looks like. The whole front of this cell is this beautiful, enormous lamellipodium. And if you look at it sideways, it looks like a baseball cap with this dense network of actin filaments basically pretty flat at the front and then the nucleus um, and all the other organelles in this round cell body. And these cells move in a very simple way at a very constant speed, very persistent, so they look like they're gliding forward without changing shape, which makes them very good for biophysical experimentation. Another fun feature of these cells is you can actually take a needle and slice off a little bit of the lamellipodium, and those little fragments will move um, completely on their own without any need for a nucleus um, or any other parts of the cell. In order to track the actin dynamics in these cells, we attach little fluorescent speckles throughout the entire network so that we can follow the movement of the whole network and the whole cell as it's moving forward. And you can see what's happening a little bit better here from the cell frame of reference, where you can see this whole actin network that's marked by these little uh, yellow arrows is sort of raining down from the front of the cell and it's being pulled in and gathered together right at the back, right next to the cell body. So part of the way that the cell is able to move is that this whole actin network made up of tens of thousands of filaments is acting as a single coherent mechanical unit. And looking more closely at what's going on here, we can use this kind of data to map out where assembly is occurring, right at the front as you would expect, and where disassembly is occurring, which is gathered into these two big spots at the back of the cell. 
That turns out to be the location where there's accumulation of a motor protein called myosin-2. And myosin-2 is best known as being the motor protein that causes muscle contraction by making actin filaments in organized arrays slide relative to each other in a skeletal muscle. In the uh, keratocyte, it's playing a slightly different role. It's getting incorporated into this branch network and then rearranging and sliding the actin filaments towards the cell body in order to rip them apart. And the combination of these concepts of the uh, myosin assembly at the back, along with what I've already told you about branched actin network assembly at the front, um, is enough to explain the overall dynamics and turnover of the whole cytoskeletal network in these cells. In order to really understand mechanics, we have to include a few more elements. For example, there's a plasma membrane that helps to coordinate what's happening at the front of the cell to the back of the cell. There's also adhesions that bind the cell to the surface. But putting those, those simple concepts together, we can actually explain a lot of complicated behaviors, including, for example, how the cells start moving. We first put them down on a cover slip. They become round like a little pancake. And then over time, they spontaneously rearrange themselves to this polarized state that we've been admiring. We can also use the same framework to explain how cells turn. So this cell, for example, is spontaneously turning in a counterclockwise way, and that's just caused by slight left-right imbalances in the forces that I've described. So that's great, but that's all about cells crawling on glass. Recently, we've gotten interested in understanding how these mechanics actually play out inside of a real living animal. So this shows a three-day-old zebrafish embryo where we have expressed a marker for actin filaments just in these motile keratocytes in the basal layer of skin. And we can induce their movement by causing a little needle stick injury in the tail of the animal. And this is how they respond in situ. So you can see they move towards the wound as they should. They move very quickly, but they look quite different from how they look um, on glass. And here we've used a trick, so we're only looking at the actin in a few of the cells, and all the rest of the cells in this field are dark. And I think you can appreciate that the shape of the cell and the sort of roughly nature of the leading edge is very different in the real complex in vivo 3D environment than it is on glass. But we understand now so much about the underlying mechanics and mechanisms that are driving cell motility in this case that we're confident we'll be able to disentangle how this complicated 3D environment is changing their behavior. And then, of course, to look at real neutrophils, um, we're working out uh, tools and methods to be able to apply the same kind of biophysical approach to understanding the complex 3D movement of neutrophils through artificial collagen matrices. In the meantime, there have been amazing advances in light microscopy including things like lattice light sheet super-resolution microscopy with adaptive optics, pioneered by um, Eric Betzig and others, to be able to look at um, neutrophils actually moving at this amazing high level of resolution inside a living animal. So these little guys here, these are neutrophils inside the ear of a zebrafish that are crawling around picking up these little blue bits of garbage. It's amazing to see at this level. So to summarize what I've shared with you today, crawling cells build themselves, and they build themselves from the ground up, starting with actin that makes filaments. Filament assembly can be regulated in space and in time, and that's enough to give you a comet tail. Adding in just a couple more things, filament sliding, network contraction, membrane tension adhesion, that's enough to give you a whole crawling cell, at least the simple cells in two dimensions. Figuring out how this works in three dimensions is going to take a little more effort, but we're confident that we can get there with force, direction, and persistence. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, they should go to the mic. <laughs> okay. Nope. All right. Um, so there are a lot of proteins that form um, dimers and then can make multimers. Can you get any um, generalizations? I, I'm thinking of one that's important in genetic recombination. It's the mm -hmm. red. So is there a way that you can generalize to other kinds of motions or forces that are going on in the cell? Ha, that's a very big question. Um, I think you know part of it, though, definitely comes down to the fact that uh, the same rules that govern protein folding also govern small-scale protein-protein interactions. And if you think about uh, sort of the surface of any proteins inside of a cell, if you've got two copies of the same uh, kind of protein, there's going to be some orientation that is the most favorable orientation for protein-protein interaction. And it turns out from, you know, just first principles that were worked out actually 50 years ago by, by Hart Crane, um, the most common kind of structure that proteins form by interacting with themselves are helical filaments, 
uh, just based on sort of asymmetries of protein structure. It's actually more difficult to make something that forms a closed structure like a viral capsid or like a hexamer that has a, a, a specific closed structure. But the, the fundamental physical principles um, for assembly in all those cases are, are pretty similar. And I think, at least for eukaryotic cells, most forces are generated either by assembly and disassembly mechanisms or by conformational changes that are associated with nucleotide hydrolysis. And the clever ways that different kinds of cells generate forces at different scales really have to do with sort of how you take all those small molecular interactions and then leverage them into these large scale structures. Hey, thank you thank so you. much. Our next speaker is Harry Y. McSween, Jr. He's a, a chancellor's professor emeritus, Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of Tennessee. He represents class one section on geology, and the title of his talk is Analyses from Near, Meteorites, and Far Spacecraft, Complementary Approaches to Planetary Exploration. Thanks, I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to represent Class 1 and to talk about how new research is helping to transform astronomical objects into geological objects. Unlike most geologists, I'm more interested in rocks that fall from the heavens rather than those already underfoot. My education is in chemistry and geology so that my approach to this subject is through geochemistry. Chemical analyses can be done remotely using spectrometers on orbited or landed spacecraft and by analyzing samples in the laboratory, if you're lucky enough to have them. And my research has involved both approaches. Let's consider two planetary objects for which we do have samples in the form of meteorites. That's Mars, a large planet that has been studied extensively, and asteroid Vesta, one of the largest asteroids, which is uh, a leftover planetary building block. So let's begin with, um, with Mars. For the analyses from afar, uh, we'll use the uh, gamma ray spectrometer on the Mars Odyssey spacecraft. Um, that's the object that looks distressingly like a toilet seat here. Um, <laughs> This uh, technique samples to about half a meter depth. That matters because the very surface can be contaminated. It samples the entire planet, but with huge footprints, hundreds of kilometers in diameter. Uh, and we can only analyze a handful of elements. To make this track tractable, let's focus on one element, what we can learn from one element, which is silicon or the way geologists mostly uh, consider it, silica, silicon dioxide. So here's a map, a global map of Mars in terms of silicon. And the colors, of course, uh, indicate the various amounts of silicon. It looks like a big variation, but if you were to look at a map of Earth uh, in the same way, you would see more than twice as much variation in silicon than we do on Mars. And we'll return back to why that is, but a conclusion from the uh, analyses from afar is that Mars' surface has a limited compositional variation in silicon, and we'll talk about why that's important. For the uh, measurements that are done near, uh, we can uh, use instruments on Mars rovers. Uh, I've indicated two here with long names that hopefully, or luckily, we have some acronyms for. Uh, these techniques allow analysis of all the major elements and some of the minor elements. Uh, we have analy analyses from seven different landing sites so far, um, but trying to extrapolate to understanding a planet from seven, lo seven locations is, is uh, challenging. And in some cases, uh, the rocks have been cleaned, that is, abraded or brushed to remove dust or adhering weathered surface materials, so we get a nice, clean 
analysis in the same way that uh, geologists break open rocks uh, with a hammer. We also have uh, meteorites that we can study in the laboratory. Uh, these meteorites are extracted from at least um, eight different surface sites. Uh, we know that because the various kinds of, of Martian meteorites um, have are clustered in terms of the times that they were ejected from Mars. Uh, we get the Mars ejection age by measuring certain kinds of isotopes. Um, these allow complete characterization of chemicals, the, the elemental composition, and also the isotopic composition. And um, we have several hundred of these samples, but unfortunately, uh, they, are, they have very limited range of uh, variation because they have to be really hard rocks to be ejected from Mars by impacts. Uh, Martian escape velocity is five kilometers a second, and a lot of rocks can't stand that. So um, we have only a few different rock types, and we have a very limited range in ages. We are biased towards the youngest ages. So here's a comparison of analyses from afar and done uh, near. This is a plot of, oops, sorry, of silicon or silica on this axis and the alkali elements, potassium and sodium, on this axis. And this is a, a diagram that terrestrial geologists use to classify volcanic rocks. And you don't really need to worry about all the names here, but what I want you to see is the orange box, which is the compositions of all of the areas that have been analyzed from afar on Mars. And it's a very small box, and, and all of these analyses are basically in the field of basalt. The uh, analyses by rovers are all of these colors here, and the analyses of Martian meteorites are these blue ones here and these uh, purple uh, uh, dots right there. Um, so a conclusion from this diagram is that laboratory analyses of meteorites and rover analyses of volcanic rocks reveal a wider range of compositions than seen in the orbital data. But silica-rich rocks over here are still uh, not present, or if they are present, they're in, in very small numbers. Uh, on Earth, we would have a lot of, of rocks that plotted uh, basically off this diagram to the right. Here's the same diagram, but it shows something else, and that is that uh, there is an age difference in rocks of different composition. And so here you see all the rocks that are older than 3 billion years from the rover analyses. We can get at the ages of those rocks by counting the densities of craters on those surfaces. It's only a qualitative measure usually, but uh, we can make some estimates of, of the quantitative value. And then uh, for the Martian meteorites, we can analyze radioactive isotopes and, and get at a, a quantitative measure of the ages. But these are all younger than two and a half billion years, most very, very much younger. And so uh, a conclusion from this is that the compositions of these lavas have evolved over time, which reflects changes in the planet's unseen mantle source region that partially melted to produce these lavas. Let's look at another diagram that silica might help us. Uh, so this is silica versus a ratio of iron to uh, magnesium. And this is a diagram that is used to say something on Earth about uh, the tectonic environment in which lavas are formed. And uh, this part of the diagram here is where uh, volcanic rocks that form in subduction zones, that is where one plate is slipping beneath another, uh, this is where they form. They form uh, by flux melting, that is uh, adding water to this hot rock and it spontaneously melts. And so that's what we are seeing here. Uh, this part of the diagram above the dashed line is uh, where uh, lavas that form by decompression melting under dry conditions form. 
And you look at all of the Martian data, and they all plot in that particular area. So what that tells us, just from chemistry, is that Mars doesn't have any subduction zones, or said another way, Mars has no plate tectonics. A rather profound inclusion from a little bit of chemistry. Um, here is a, a, another comparison. These hatched boxes here are the compositions of older volcanoes on Mars as measured from afar by the gamma ray spectrometer. And the black dots are uh, some of the, uh, the rover data for rocks that are the same age. And you see there's a good correlation there in terms of, again, uh, silica, in this case just iron oxide. But the blue boxes here are the younger volcanoes on Mars, and all the blue dots are the Martian meteorites, which surely must be derived from those younger volcanoes. So there's something profoundly wrong here, and with a lot of, uh, of extra work, we have figured out that the Amazonian volcanoes are covered with dust that has a low silica content. So uh, our measurements from afar are not giving us analyses of the rocks themselves. They're measuring this dust. Okay, let's change to the other body, asteroid Vesta. Uh, Vesta has been explored by the Dawn orbiting spacecraft, which carried another gamma ray spectrometer. In this case, it also uh, measured neutrons, and it has basically the same characteristics and many of the same restrictions that the gamma ray spectrometer uh, that we flew to Mars has. Um, we don't have any rovers scuttling across the surface yet uh, for Vesta, but uh, we do have uh, Vestan meteorites. Uh, these are some examples uh, of how they look like in, in thin section as viewed through the microscope. There are basaltic lavas, there are plutonic rocks, that is, lavas that cool slowly underground, and there are breaches that, are, uh, that form by impact, and they are basically mixtures of those other two kinds. And these allow complete chemical and isotopic characterization and very good sampling. It's a relatively small body, and we have more than 1,000 of these meteorites. It's the best uh, studied body in terms of meteorites uh, that we have. So here is a comparison of near and far data. Uh, this is a plot of iron over silicon and iron over oxygen. And uh, remember that this is a very large footprint when measured from afar. So we basically get a global composition. And this is the one sigma and two sigma uncertainties for that composition. And then this is compared with the, the data from near, uh, the meteorite data. And you can see that there's a very nice overlap there. So a conclusion from this is that this is a virtually unique correlation, and it helps confirm the identity of Vesta as the parent body for these meteorites, which is originally hypothesized based on similarities in te telescopic spectra. We can also map the distribution of these various rock types on Vesta. Uh, mainly using uh, neutron absorptions, and uh, this is a, a key for the, the uh, basaltic lavas, uh, the plutonic rocks, and the uh, rocks that are impact breaches, mixtures of that and that. And the conclusion from this distribution is that the plutonic rocks all occur, well, mostly occur here in the southern hemisphere. This line here marks the boundary of a huge impact crater that removed a lot of material, so it makes sense that we would see underground rocks at that point. The, uh, the basaltic lavas occur uh, mostly in the equator, and the, uh, the breaches basically are a soil that covers most of the rest of the surface. Here was a surprise from um, the study of Vesta. We didn't think that there was going to be any water on this particular asteroid. It's just a dry rock, uh, but 
uh, the, it turns out that the, the uh, neutron instrument is very good at measuring hydrogen, and this is a map of hydrogen on the surface. You can see it's located in just one place, and we think that's in the form of water, but we scratched our heads about why it has this form and where it came from. Then we started looking at some of these breaches again. Here is one, and notice the little black clasts in here. Those are foreign clasts of a different kind of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite that contains minerals that contain water. So what we're seeing here uh, in this is a, an impact splash uh, from an impact of, of carbonaceous chondrite uh, that uh, left remnants on the surface. Finally, we can say something about Vesta's unseen internal structure. Uh, Vesta's bulk density and gravity field, as measured by the Dawn spacecraft, are consistent with it having an internal core, an iron core, that has a mass fraction of about 18% of the body. We can also, uh, since we have the meteorites, we can measure trace elements that love to be partitioned into metal, and we can model their, partition, their partition, partitioning to predict a metallic core mass of 15 to 20 percent, which is in remarkably good agreement with uh, the geophysical measurement. So a conclusion is the planetesimal building blocks of planets may have been already differentiated, that is, melted to form a core, a mantle, and a crust, just like Vesta has, uh, at the time that they were uh, accreted uh, to form the planets. So here are the conclusions. The geochemical characterization, if done by remote sensing only, can lack sufficient detail for in-depth interpretation. If it's done using samples only, it misses the necessary geologic context and global perspective. Besides the topics covered here, these kinds of analyses can provide constraints on lots of other things. Uh, the age of the samples, geochemical cycles, geologic history, uh, organic matter in them, and others. Mars and Vesta demonstrate the advantages of exploration using both near and far analyses as we continue to transform these astronomical bodies into worlds shaped by more or less familiar geologic processes. Thanks very much. Questions? I had a question. It would seem that these meteorites of pieces of Mars or Vesta, are they, are they rare? And are they, do you search for them or do people bring them to you? Um, they used to be very rare. In fact, at the beginning of my career, I was one of the, with another graduate student, I was in one of the people who suggested that we have meteorites from Mars. We got laughed out of the room, but uh, they, there are various reasons why the, the idea was ultimately um, accepted. We have several hundred of them now, and mostly they have been found in hostile places like Antarctica and hot deserts like the Sahara. Um, but uh, we don't have as many as we would like, and as you can see from the, the, the plots that I showed you, we have a very biased sampling of Mars because they all have the same age, and, or mostly have the same age, and very similar chemistry. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Now, I have a very naive question, which it sounded like you were about to answer. Um, how do you know that the meteorite comes from Mars or comes from Vesta? Um, the, the meteorites from Mars contain uh, rare gases, that is, noble gases, both in terms of their, their concentration and their isotopic composition, that are, are very unusual, but they are a dead ringer for the rare gases that occur in the atmosphere of Mars. So those uh, gases were implanted when these meteorites were shocked during launch, and uh, that acts as a fingerprint for Mars. 
for Vesta, uh, we just don't have any other bodies out there that have the same spectra as the meteorites and Vesta. So it's kind of, uh, it's the only target around. Thank you. Our third speaker is Chung Pei Ma. She is the Judy Chandler Webb Professor in Physical Sciences, Departments of Astronomy and Physics, University of California, Berkeley. She rep is a representative from Class One. So we're now we went six five four three two one of 2021. Now we're going one two three four five six uh, with this session and the next uh, with our next speaker. So we have back to back from Class One. The title of uh, Chung Pei's talk is. Uh, gravity's fatal attraction, black holes at the centers of galaxies. Is there a clicker? Is there a clicker? Okay. Thank you. I'll take that. Thank you. No problem. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wessler, and thanks to the Academy and my colleagues for giving me a chance to speak to get today. Uh, when I was nine years old, my violin teacher in Taipei, Taiwan, asked if I wanted to be a musician, and if so, I should probably uh, move to Vienna or New York City to further my studies. And I said, I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> now, looking back, I think it's good to leave the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto and the repair of the Hubble Space Telescope to much more capable hands. And instead, I've enjoyed um, being an armchair astrophysicist, sitting back and um, marveling at the cosmos. So I would like to um, take you one step further uh, from the solar system and uh, going into the, uh, towards the centers of galaxies. So to begin with, I just want to um, say that black holes are actually simple. They're predicted to exist by uh, Einstein's general relativity. In fact, uh, it's a mathematical solution to his field equation. So theoretically, uh, they should exist. And a black hole of zero net charge is completely specified by two numbers, its mass and its spin. So imagine two people of, say, the same size and eye color were indistinguishable. How simple and boring this world would be, and how the academy probably wouldn't need all these classes and sections to represent the uh, rich universe. But black holes are difficult to find because they're black. <laughs> so broadly speaking, there are two classes of astrophysical black holes, small and big. And the small black holes are natural and evolution of stars, massive stars. They live a spectacularly short life and spectacularly as supernova explosions. And then what's left over uh, are black holes of roughly tens of solar masses to about 150 solar masses. And here is a Hall of Fame a list of nearly 100 such systems, but in binary black holes that in its final merger uh, distort the space time so much so as to emit gravitational waves captured by the spectacular LIGO and Virgo collaboration. And this is not the focus of my today's talk, but LIGO and Virgo and Kagra had started their O4 operation in their engineering testing mode right now. So any moment, uh, we may be learning more such systems due to their uh, improved sensitivity. Now, the big black holes have been found at the centers of galaxies. And here are two the best studied and most famous and best known supermassive black holes ranging from millions of solar masses to many billion solar masses. On the left is the home of um, our own 
our home galaxy, the Milky Way. And you can see at the center that have been uh, studied very well over four decades, and thanks to Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Gentel's teams, and they were able to use a single star, the S2 star, that orbits very closely to the central black hole and tracking their motions very carefully to infer this black hole's existence. And they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020. On the right is a completely different black hole. It's um, 1,500 times more massive at 6 billion solar masses and much, much further at about 50 five million light years away uh, in a giant elliptical galaxy called M87. And I'm sure you've all seen these uh, beautiful images from the Event Horizon Telescope capturing the gas um, very close to the hole um, due to uh, emitting uh, radiation and this photon ring. And the Milky Way uh, black hole is at about 26,000 light years away. So now, by now, we've known about um, more than 100 such systems detected through dynamical means, luminous stuff we can trace to infer the invisible black hole. And we also know that bigger black holes live in bigger galaxies. And so there's a very in intriguing correlation. They seem to grow symbiotically. And at the low end, sort of the Milky Way, and the high end, um, M87, have been uh, the most massive known black hole in the local universe for 30 plus years. So my team went out asking, well, we know that bigger black uh, galaxies exist, bigger than the M87 galaxy, so can we find bigger black holes than this five, six billion solar mass black hole? And it turned out that, yes, we did. And here are two examples of these super duper massive black holes uh, at about 20 billion solar masses in two very different environments. On the right, what we found in 2011, in, at the center of the, this very, very massive, in fact, the most massive local galaxy, NGC 4089. And this black hole was not easy to find, but the location itself is not so surprising because 4089 is so massive and Coma Cluster, a society of hundreds of galaxies uh, gravitationally bound, is the richest cluster in the local universe. So it's like finding a skyscraper in New York City. It's not too surprising. Now, on the left, we found comparably massive black hole, but it's in a less rich environment. It's in a galaxy group. And this galaxy itself, 1600, is about three times less massive. And the environment is probably 10 times less massive in dark matter. So why would a skyscraper be, uh, be, you know, at, be found in a sort of midtown, uh, midwestern town, town in the United States? And that's a mystery uh, we're still trying to solve. Perhaps this galaxy has grown super big and this black hole had grown super massive by uh, eating up its neighbors, because as you can see, in the, its neighborhood, there are very few, very bright galaxies. So um, massive black holes seem to live in different environments, and we're still trying to understand why. So I just want to say a little bit about why these big black holes have been difficult to find. You were saying bigger things are easier to find. So it turned out that um, big things are rare. So you need to go further to find the next biggest thing. So at, take the coma cluster as an example, at 330 million light years, uh, we need to get velocity to stars. These are the luminous tracers we use to uh, map out the gravitational potential. We need to get stars very close to the hole to be within about 1,000 light years. Now, 1,000 light years sound very, very big, but if I shrink, the scale to coma to say between Berkeley and Los Angeles. Uh, so to be able to um, find the black hole, it will be equivalent to trying to measure the speed of Yo-Yo Ma's fingers while he is playing the flight of the bumblebee. So we do need fantastic angular resolution and the Hubble Space Telescope was able to provide that. But there was another challenge for these very, very massive galaxies and that is 
the central region of these galaxies turn out to be very, very faint. And here you are seeing the surface density of stellar light as a function of radius from each galaxy, um, from each galaxy center. And the blue ones are just sort of the run of the mill elliptical galaxies. So you can see the density of stars increase towards the center here. But the red curves here show the most massive uh, galaxies known in the local universe. Interestingly, even though overall they're much more luminous, toward the core, it's very faint. They're, the stars are somehow have disappeared or devoid of stars. And so in order to be able to measure the spectra to get the velocity from the stars, we need telescopes bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. So we actually needed to use the largest ground-based eight to 10 meter telescopes to get spectra, to get enough signal to noise to study these uh, galaxies. So we've been using Keck, Gemini, to get spectroscopy, the velocities of stars very close to the hole. And we use a Hubble Space Telescope to get imaging, to get a spatial distribution of stars. And together, we also do a very extensive orbit modeling. We compute, allow stellar orbits on supercomputers um, and assume different black hole mass, shapes, and so on for the galaxy. And we project them on the sky uh, in mock tests. And then we try to see which set of parameters best match the data we can get. So in slightly more detail, I just want to show you the kind of spectra we've been able to get from some of the most sensitive available uh, spectrographs on these biggest telescopes. So we've been taking advantage of these so-called integral field spectrographs. And we take many, many exposures of one galaxy. But in each exposure, it, um, the spectrograph can give us thousands of spectra of what these stars are doing in the galaxy. So here are just two examples of many, many uh, spectra we're able to get in the optical wavelength here you're seeing. And, um, and intensity of light. And you can see these absorption features due to chemical, different chemical uh, elements in the galaxies, calcium, hydrogen beta, and magnesium, for example. And collection of stars in that patch of the galaxy broaden these very sharp lines which would exist in individual stars due to the Doppler effects. So we try to fit to the data in black here, uh, this kind of velocity distribution of stars and trying to find the best fit velocity distribution in shown in red here that will give us information about how fast these, you know, the swarm of bees are moving around. And from that, we can use that to feel the gravitational potential of the black holes. And so we are able to get maps such as these. So we are, in this case, we're seeing the famous M87, which we looked at recently in a paper we just published last month. So this is the galaxy you're seeing, but instead of showing the light, the photon counts image, we're actually showing velocity maps from the spectrograph on Keck. And you can see that the upper left side of this giant, beautiful galaxy is blue shifted. It's moving towards us slightly. And the opposite end is moving away, redshift slightly, with about 30 kilometers per second um, rotation. So this is the first time we've mapped out the large scale rotation of this galaxy. And on the right, it, show, it shows the second moment of the velocity distribution, the dispersion. And you can see that towards the center, it's reaching about 450 kilometers per kilometers per second, and that's the work of the black hole. It's speeding up the stars to such high velocities, and we can use this velocity information to backtrack the hole's mass and the shape of the galaxy and what the dark matter is doing altogether. So we can come back to the question about binary black holes that's giving us such a great time um, giving out gravitational waves in the LIGO's uh, bandwidth. It turned out that, excitingly, big black holes come in twins, too. And in fact, they're expected to exist uh, due to a natural evolution of galaxies. And the reason being, galaxies grow by mergers. So here are six beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope showing different systems of merging galaxies in different stages of evolution. So you can see the two on the left 
st still coming together, not quite merged yet. And at the bottom right is a whole mess of a train wreck. And during this process, new stars are formed and many, many things, uh, beautiful things happen during this process. And a bigger galaxy, presumably an el elliptical galaxy, will be, form be formed in this process. So now if each galaxy host of supermassive black hole at its center, they can come together, in, in fact, energetically favor to form a bound binary supermassive black hole at its center. If this binary can further lose its orbital energy and angular momentum, then it can actually reach the stage where it can tear up space-time so much that it would emit gravitational waves too. But these waves will come in a much, much, at much, much lower frequencies. So these billion solar mass black holes I've been talking about, they're expected to give out gravitational waves at about one to 10 100 nanohertz range shown here in the spectrum of uh, gravitational waves versus frequency. So far, LIGO has detected the very high end of the spectrum, this new window into the universe, gravitational waves. And all the lower frequencies have yet to be found. So imagine this is a new cosmic symphony orchestra, and we have only heard the piccolo. No offense to piccolos, they are beautiful, but we are still waiting for the beautiful sound of the violin and the cello and the bass and the bassoon uh, at the lower frequencies. And wouldn't it be remarkable to find those? So I'm a member of these teams that ha are currently trying to find gravitational waves from billion solar mass black holes. And this is what we're trying to do. So instead of using human-made interferometers like LIGO on Earth, we resort to nature and we use pulsars, these rapidly rotating neutron stars, in fact, millisecond pulsars, as our detectors, as a uh, uh, gift of nature. And what happens is these pulsars are extremely precise clocks. So the pulse, uh, one second, we get hundreds to thousand pulses precisely uh, spaced. But if there are gravitational waves coming in from these merging supermassive black holes out there, then they're expected to distort the distance between Earth and each pulsar, the space time, by just a tiny bit uh, to imprint fluctuations in the arrival time of the pulses. Of course, it's extremely weak signature, uh, signals, but these pulses are so well measured that we can tease that out. So the expected signal that we're looking for here is the so-called theoretical, you know, this theoretical Hellian Downs curve predicted in 1983, is that there should be this correlated signature here as a function of the separation of pulsar pairs. So these pulsars are in our Milky Way doing their own business, but we can correlate the time delays from dif different pairs from the center to the uh, for very closely spaced pairs to outer widely separate pairs. And Hellings and Downs in 1983 told us if there were gravitational waves coming in causing the distortions, this should be the, what one should look for. So, I just want to um, highlight that there have been international teams, pulsar timing array teams, that have been looking for this over uh, the past decade. And the 11-year data from the Nanograph collaboration, the North American collaboration, uh, I'm a member of this collaboration, saw, you can see, it, there's not quite enough uh, signal here to detect this blue hellings and downs curve. And in 2020, combining 12.5 years of data, a little bit tantalizing. Uh, so please stay tuned. We're analyzing the 15-year data with more, pulse, uh, with more uh, pulsars, 68 pulsars, and um, something may happen. <laughs> okay, so I just want to end by showing these exciting ongoing and future um, instrumentations and to say that Black hole studies, the future of black hole studies is bright. And many of my colleagues 
we are answering some of these big questions. We have hints of answers to these, but uh, the picture is not yet complete. So please stay tuned. Thank you very much. We have questions. How many solar systems do we have? Is there an estimate? And how many black holes are there? Is there an estimate? Uh, so you see the, here, we would like to know the mass function of black holes. And of course, uh, the big black holes, we know the mass function of galaxies quite well now. And you saw the correlation. So we also have some indication for the mass function of the supermassive black holes. But we are not, um, we don't have a complete picture yet. So we have ongoing surveys to, um, to map that out further. The supermassive ones were small once. Where are the mid-sized guys? Absolutely. So they're called the intermediate mass black holes. And they should probably exist between filling the gap I talked about, hundreds to you know, 10 to the 5, 100,000 solar masses. These systems should probably exist, but they turn out to be very difficult to see observationally uh, because the distances are just a little they're close, but the black holes are even smaller than the ones we're seeing. So we just don't quite have the right angular resolution. But there are now um, powerful instruments, hopefully, to fill in that gap. OK. Turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ma. You're terrific. Our final speaker for this session is Julie Segra. She is senior investigator at the National Human Genome Research Institute, National Institutes of Health. Uh, she represents class two section on genetics and her title is The Human Microbiome, Finding Friends Amongst F the Foes. Well, thank you so much. Um, and it's, it's really an honor to be here today uh, and especially have enjoyed our session with class one meets class two. And of course, Julie and I have the connection that our fathers are both physicists. So if you are from class one, you can see what your children might go on to do and stay tuned. So you'll, you'll need to know about this stuff too. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, the work that my lab has been doing for the last 15 years. So. Let's just start from the beginning. When I say human microbiome, what do I mean? I mean the collection of all of the microorganisms and for the geneticists and their DNA living in association with the human body. And I'm gonna particularly mean the bacteria, the fungi, and the viruses that live in and on our bodies. And so just some like kind of sense of what is the overall numbers here because this was really a revelation that started me on this process. I was trained in human genetics and human genomics, and I really thought about the 23 human chromosomes. And especially I thought that if we learned about the genetic material of those 23 chromosomes, that that would lead us on our way to curing human disease. But in fact, humans are super organisms, and a lot of the ways in which we actually modulate disease outcomes is by uh, modifying the bacteria and paying more attention to the bacteria and fungi viruses that colonize us. So humans have 30 trillion cells. The bacteria and fungi are as numer numerous. So there's also about 30 uh, trillion bacteria and fungi. The viruses are much more vast, especially if you consider the phage that um, live, inside bacteria, live inside bacteria. So but the numbers on here, the human genome is like 3,000 million base pairs of DNA. But each cell contains the same genetic material, except for the immunologists, I understand. But the bacterial genome is going to be 3 million base pairs. So that seems a lot smaller. But these bacteria, there are multiple species, strains. The variation quickly adds up. So that the microbiome genetic material equals or is even larger than the human genome. So that's what I set about to try to understand. 
And the functions of the microbiome, as I was referring to, is the humans, in my case, now I'm going to work on the skin microbiome, the contribution is to both health and disease. So the properties that we've learned over the last 10 years, 15 years, even longer, is that the microbiome tunes the immune system. The, and that is, um, you know, very beneficial throughout your lifetime. Deficits in that can have um, defects in wound healing and lots of just immune processes. The skin microbes, they also maintain the skin barrier. They break down products made by human cells into natural moisturizing factor. If you have defects in the microbes or the skin barrier, that's a, um, setting yourself up for atopic dermatitis or eczema. And one of the most important factors that I think about is how these commensal beneficial microbes provide colonization resistance. Because if you think about it, it's very energy intensive to maintain a sterile environment. Much better to find microbes who you either tolerate or may even be providing benefit to you than to try to maintain sterile sterility on the surface. So, but those microbes, that colonization resistance, can be broken down even by processes like antibiotics. So how do we characterize a microbiome, right? We've all had a lot of swabs stuck up our noses over the last few years. And you could culture that on a Petri dish. And you could culture from that, you could characterize a couple microbes, and they, some of them are easier to culture than others. But how do you count these 30 trillion cells that I've, that I've said? That's where my scientific upbringing in the Human Genome Project came in really handy when I started to ask these kinds of questions. Because the Human Genome Project that brought together this puzzle of the human genome revolutionized the scale of projects, but they also revolutionized the sequencing technology and the compute power that we have to analyze these data sets. So I think of sequencing as a new lens to observe biology. And that is true if we want to observe chromatin states and so on. But I think about the microscope and how we used to observe microbial communities with this microscope. And now I think of the DNA sequencer where a microbe on a, on a plate you could colonize, you could probably culture and look at 100 microbes. I now can look at 100,000 microbes all together on one sequencing run, and I can understand what is the bacterial strain, and I can also understand the community in which it exists. The first experiment that we set out to do was to characterize the human skin microbiome. A lot of people work on the gut microbiome, I understand, but my lab has been interested for a long time in dermatologic disorders and how they manifest at stereotypic locations. You can have eczema on the inside of the elbow and psoriasis on the outside of the elbow. And we started to wonder whether there was a topographic map of the microbiome. This would be very hard to observe, like in the gut microbiome, but on the skin, we have access to all of these body sites. So we set up an initial survey where we looked at 18 different body sites. And what we found was that the, the microbiome is described as these pie-shaped things, and it really has to do with the nutrients that are available to those microbes. So the oily sites are going to take advantage of using the oils, the sebum, and that's where you're going to see the preponderance of the propionobacterium. The moist creases have more Staphylococcus carinobacterium, and the dry sites have the lowest biomass, but some of the greatest diversity. And from this, we really kind of came to a revolutionary idea about the human body as an ecosystem, and that the bend of my left elbow is closer to Susan Wessler's than it is to my underarm, because this is a moist crease and this is a sweaty, you know, hair-filled um, site. We think about this in the context of health, but we also think about this in the context of disease. And for a long time, my lab has studied atopic dermatitis or childhood eczema, where we take samples from kids at flare, which is when it's like flaring, and we're trying to understand how the microbial communities change. So we take the samples and we're doing shotgun metagenomic sequencing, and we're also culturing, and we're comparing it against a global survey. Some of what we're looking for in the global survey is how the different medical practices and the use of antibiotics um, impact what kinds of skin microbes colonize kids. Um, but here what we're seeing is that there are strains of Staphylococcus that increase during the flare. And our hope is that in the future we could begin to 
um, do surveys of kids' microbiome and understand when a kid might be about to flare and initiate treatment before they've itched themselves red. And our hope there is even that we could have outcomes for atopic dermatitis, but also benefits for asthma and allergic rhinitis that are two other atopies. So, okay, enough about the friends. Let me tell you a little bit about the foes because the other part of my lab is also working on tracking hospital outbreaks in the context of multidrug resistant organisms. So I just want to tell you one story about, um, I work at the NIH and um, in collaboration at the NIH Clinical Center, we um, admitted our first patient with a carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumonia who was coming for treatment, for um, um, follow-up treatment after a lung transplant. And um, we knew that she was colonized with carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumonia, a, 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 a bacteria for which there is very little um, antibiotics left. And she was discharged. And then two months later, patient two came up with the same bacterial organism, carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumonia, then patient three, patient four, patient five. And so we had a uh, or our hospital epidemiologist had the question, do the isolates from patient one match patients two, three, four, and five? Because if we have a match, that means that we've had, likely, hospital-acquired transmission. And that would mean that the contact isolation for that patient was insufficient, and also that the screening of the patients was insufficient, which would mean that we maybe have other patients in the hospital. That would mean that we need to radically change hospital practice. If we don't have a match, then we're on the other side of this, and that means that we've had a separate introduction because we were increasing the screening. That happens a lot, too, that when you look more, you find more. So that would mean the contact isolation was sufficient and the screening of the patients was sufficient, so stay the course. The issue is that at that point, my clinical micro lab was still running these pulsed field gels, and the resolution they could get was that these were sequence type 258, but that doesn't really help us because 70% of the healthcare associated Klebsiella pneumonias in the US are sequence type 258. So as I was already working with the clin microbiologists and got along with them, I said, maybe let's, um, let's try sequencing them. We had been studying patient number one and what we found was that the microbes, I've talked to you about this topographic distribution. So when she was colonized, we actually cultured isolates from the urinary tract, the throat, and the groin area. And so she actually was one patient but had three separate colonizations, because, I mean, from an ancestral, but they had sort of diversified. So from the throat isolate, there are three small genetic changes over a five million base pair genome. But those are a signature that those mutations occurred on that patient during the six months she was colonized. The groin, groin isolate had three different SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. When we sequenced the, the four subjects, what we found immediately, like within 24 hours of sequencing them, was that patient three had those same small genetic changes as the throat isolate. But patient two had those same three changes, but had one additional change. So the next morning when we met with the hospital epidemiologist, we said, well, we think that patient one's throat isolate was transmitted to patient three, and that patient three transmitted to patient two. And we understand that that doesn't make any sense. And she said, no, that's exactly what I think happened. If you look in the bottom part, you see the, the, where the patients were in the hospital every day. And patient one and patient three overlapped in the ICU. And then patient one left the ICU, and patient three and patient two were together in the ICU. So the genomic and the epidemiologic data matched. In real time, we had established a connection between these isolates and these patients. And at that point, we also started looking and found other patients in the hospital who were colonized and kept, um, kept being identified. So if we were on the left-hand side trying to reconstruct the transmission based on epidemiologic data, we would have this plate of spaghetti. But instead, combining genomic information in real time with epidemiologic data, it empowered our clinicians to understand which patients were the likely source of transmitting to which other patients, which was useful in terms of understanding what possible interventions could be enacted, and as well, which places did we not need to spend resources, that there was not a connection between patients 17 and 18, and the fact that they shared a burn card 
was not important. My lab now is working on Candida auris, an emerging fungal pathogen that was first identified about a decade ago on three separate continents and has been brought to the US through, through medical tourism and travel. Candida auris is a fungal pathogen that's also been rated an urgent threat by the CDC because the number of drugs that we have to treat fungi are even less than what we have to treat uh, bacteria because fungi are eukaryotes as we are. So it's hard to squeeze a drug in that's toxic to the fungi and not to us. We've been looking because the spread of Candida auris is in nursing homes. And we've been trying to understand what is the risk factors there. And the issue there is again, Candida auris colonizes the skin and it causes inflections in the bloodstream. But the skin is um, constantly differentiating with the stem cells and the skin will turn over every two to four weeks. So you're shedding five times 10 to the eighth human cells into, this, into the um, area, but you're also, you're also shedding over um, 10 to the seventh microbes per day. Now, most of those microbes are gonna be dead, but some of them have evolved ways to stay alive even in these inanimate surfaces like Acinetobacter and Candida auris. And we think that's one of the primary risk factors for nursing homes is that the patients stay there for quite a long time. And that meant that we wanted to understand the transmission and we're looking now at how the, the isolates in the nose are similar to the feet, to the hands, to understand is a patient colonizing themselves or is the environment colonizing the patient and our, our, our roommates colonizing each other? So I've talked about microbiome as this new lens. And in this case, I, um, rec uh, with, along with my clinical colleague, recruited this cohort of 60 patients in nursing homes. And we were looking for Candida auris. But remember, sequencing is a rather agnostic um, uh, tool for finding things. So it's not just that you're gonna find underneath the lamp po post the, the, the keys that you're lost. You're gonna be looking at an entire landscape. So how, this has been the technology breakthrough for my lab over the last few years, um, which is that now I used to only be able to observe microbes that I already knew about. I could reconstruct their genomes based on matching them to a cultured isolate. But now I can reconstruct microbes simply based on the shotgun metagenomic data. The challenge here has been the human genome is all these puzzle pieces and then you bring them, you know, and then you sort of assemble them into the human genome. But I've been given a box that has hundreds of puzzles thrown in there together. And some of those puzzles have a hundred pieces and some of them have a thousand pieces. But as with each puzzle showing a different landscape, these microbial genomes also have differences in their GC content, in their tetranucleotide frequency. So I can assemble the genomes of multiple different organisms from this clinical sample. And when I did that, not only did we find on the skin of these patients, Candida auris, we found multi-drug resistant E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, these are some of what we call the escape pathogens because of their antibiotic resistance. And it was important that when we have the full genome of this organism, I can tell that this isn't just a beneficial Klebsiella pneumonia. This is a Klebsiella pneumonia that's carrying NDM1 or Nudelum, um, well, anyway, is carrying an antibiotic resistance gene. So we're now thinking about the risk that these multi-drug resistant bacteria on the skin of patients will have to the delivery of healthcare when you think about putting in central lines and ports. So in conclusion, genomic sequencing makes the invisible world of microbes visible and identifiable. And my hope is that by understanding the microbiome, we'll revolutionize what it means to be human and what it means to be healthy and provide new insights to fight our microbial foes and cultivate our microbial friends. And I'd like to just finish by acknowledging the amazing collaborators that I've had at the NIH, my lab when it all started um, and who they are now, uh, my mentors throughout um, my scientific training who are still my mentors to this day, my family, thank you for joining me today, um, and I dedicate this talk to the memory of my mother. Thank you.
question. So, Julie, is that left-handed DNA or right-handed DNA? You know, I was hoping no one would ask that, but it is to embrace the National Academy's idea of science and art. <laughs> and Section 26. I was actually going to ask if she got it in Bloomingdale's or something. So, but. the um, so is, is, is the antibiotic resistance that you just described, is it due to a plasmid and is there a free transfer between some of these species or is it due to each one having its own ability to be resistant? Right, so microbes can be um, resistant based on chromosomal changes, but we are also um, finding plasmid-based uh, mediated um, antibiotic resistance. In other um, cases, where we've studied the patients who carried the um, Klebsiella pneumonia, which is on the plasmid PK, PQIL. We have always worried about superbugs. One of the reasons would be that that plasmid could move into commensal organisms or into other organisms. We, we've seen that on very, very rare occasions, and it is specific to certain plasmids, the, um, that many plasmids have a fairly intimate relationship with a certain type of bacteria. So we, we don't see the widespread that we had once feared. Other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Oh wait, we have a question wait, wait. coming, I think. Sorry, all right, Sorry. We, we have time. documented the pathway of transmission. What was the solution for uh, preventing that in the future? How does yeah. that tr you know, transmit yeah. to no, policy? No, you're right, because we haven't had a transmission in the hospital for 10 years. Um, yeah, so of, 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 of a KPC organism. Um, and actually, in the end, what it was for us was the NIH Clinical Center set up a special cohorted area. Um, and it, 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 it was a lot of little things, but it really ended up strict attention to um, you know, practices like hand washing, but also just having a cohorted area really enhanced this, the safety for the patients. And, um, and it, 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 it was stopped. Yeah, thanks. Last case, is that, is that just because it's a nursing home that the, these people had, were transmitting so many of these? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I study nursing homes because I feel like they're some of the more disadvantaged members of our um, society. And I think in the um, previously, that study actually was set up before COVID. And I think that um, we now have a much greater appreciation that nursing homes are part of the ecosystems of healthcare delivery. Um, and that we should be providing more infection control and consideration. And I appreciate this administration's um, interest in nursing homes as um, you know a priority for healthcare systems. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And we could continue and thank all the speakers for this session. Um, and. We will reconvene at 3.30, so they have about a little more than a half hour to stretch your legs, and uh, I guess it's probably not raining out, and we'll be back at uh, 3.30 for the last session, research briefings.